Okay, so let's go for the closing of this uh, of this course. So what we saw in during these lectures were like two directions of using artificial of considering artificial intelligence and cryptography. One direction was to use artificial intelligence for cryptography, so to solve some designs and analysis problems in uh, in cryptography. And uh, the other direction is using cryptography, such as, for example, uh, uh, secure multi-party computation that we saw until now, to solve privacy and security problems in uh, machine learning. So either privacy was mostly the realm of uh, we saw of secure multi-party computation, uh, security was more the realm of differential privacy. Although also differential privacy has been used and it is being used for privacy concerns in machine learning. But let's say that for the sake of this course, we just saw in the uh, problem of adversarial ex of countering adversarial example. But for the first direction, anyway, we saw how to use artificial intelligence models to solve some particular design uh, problems in symmetric cryptography in particular. So we want to have, let's say, symmetric ciphers in general, where we have low-level primitives such as Boolean functions and desk boxes, mm -hmm. or orthogonal arrays in general, that have good cryptographic properties. And the traditional approach that we, let's say, just sketched in the uh, in one of the in the second lecture is to use mathematical constructions for these kind of objects, like mathematical constructions for Boolean functions or S boxes. On the other hand, the approach given, us by, uh, given to us by artificial intelligence is to support the designer of a cipher by giving him or her different primitives generated through artificial intelligence with good properties, and then from there, the cryptographer can select, let's say, the best one with respect both to security properties and to implementation properties. And this has been done mostly up to now, as far as I know, at least, uh, using optimization algorithms, such as evolutionary algorithms or swarm intelligence optimization algorithms, or computational models such as cellular automata. Neural networks a bit, but they were not very successful in this, uh, uh, in this respect for the design. We will see later that they will be interesting for something else. But anyway, mostly cellular automata for constructing S boxes, so vectorial Boolean functions. And uh, so, first direction that let's say I think it's interesting to look at is the one that we saw at the end of the last lecture, uh, at the of the end of the second lecture, sorry, which is the evolution of construction for cryptographic primitives. So we said that most of the works in the literature are addressing the construction of Boolean functions using direct search, a direct search approach. So we have a representation of a single Boolean function, for example, as a bit string that is encoding the truth table of this function, and then we want to find the optimal truth table or the optimal bit string corresponding to the best Boolean function with respect to a subset of uh, cryptographic properties. Instead, what we saw something that is more recent is to do not evolve the, prim the, the primitives directly, so the Boolean function in a, in a direct way, but rather to evolve mathematical construction of them. And genetic programming is very apt for this kind of, uh, uh, for this kind of work because it is just evolving a syntactic tree where the inputs can be either single bits, as in the direct search case, so we can add single variables, or they can be um, in their own smaller Boolean functions, what we call the, let's say, C functions or predefined functions in the second lecture. The problem is that so far the results showed that these constructions that GP is able to find are optimal, so they are able to find Boolean functions with good uh, nonlinearity and balancedness, for example, but they are all equivalent to something, or at least most of them are equivalent to uh, constructions that are previously have been previously known by human math mathematicians back in the day. So the research direction here would be to see to develop more this construction here that you see here, to see if we can find previously unknown constructions. So something that is new 
and this mm. should be done by checking, let's say, equivalence by using a specific sort of equivalence relation to see if the functions that we can construct using the new um, construction, so the one that is about by GP, are equivalent with respect to this affine equivalence uh, relationship to those constructed through the traditional construction. So this is a first idea. Second idea is what I call evolutionary based distinguishers. And this has to do again with symmetric cryptography and with the direction of using artificial intelligence for symmetric cryptography. But instead of using it for uh, for designing primitives, here we are using for doing crypt analysis, for, so for doing attacks. We saw something already yesterday with uh, Stefan's lecture that was about side channel analysis. And you saw there that deep learning is quite good. It has become, it has became, it has become the, um, the standard, the gold standard in the, at least in the academic field for carrying out side channel attacks over both symmetric algorithms and uh, uh, asymmetric or public key algorithms, but we didn't see anything about doing mathematical cryptanalysis of a cipher. And actually, this is a very recent research thread that has been initiated by like three years ago, four years ago by Aaron Gore. There was this uh, paper that was published in cryptography, in um, crypto, uh, cryptography conference that is held in Santa Barbara every year where he showed how to use a neural network, a deep neural network, to perform differential cryptanalysis or more specifically differential distinguishers. So what do we mean? The idea is that we are considering a chosen plain text attack. So something where the attacker, the adversary has access to the encryption machine and then Eve, for example, can choose what are the plain text and see the corresponding ciphertext without knowing the secret key. So the idea here is that we are considering in a, in a block cipher such as AES, then in general it is not done on AES because on AES it is very difficult, but there are smaller ciphers such as Simon or Spec where they have like a smaller uh, state size of 64 bits instead of 128 bits like, uh, like AES where these attacks become quite successful. So the idea is that we are considering two different plain texts that we choose, and then we are doing them in such a way that we know we can compute. If we know two plain texts, then we can compute their difference, which is simply the XOR. And then the goal is to compute what is called the differential probability. So the probability of passing from a single uh, difference that is fixed to another difference. So the difference will be delta star here, which is the difference at the output. So we want to see if we are causing a difference here that is fixed. What is the probability of getting a difference, a specific difference in the output here by summing again the XOR of the two ciphertext of X and X prime. And in a distinguishing attack, if you remember, the idea for Eve is quite uh, simple in the sense of what she wants to achieve. She just wants to be able to classify whether something is the encryption of a real pair, let's say so a, a proper a legit message, or some random message that has been chosen with uniform, uh, with uniform probability. And the tool, the classical tool to do this, so to compute all these differential probabilities, is the so-called difference distribution table, which we kind of saw already, uh, let's say, a smaller version when we were talking about the differential uniformity for S-boxes. So that is basically the same thing, only that in that case we don't have the probabilities in the table. We have the number of, uh, uh, of differences that are mapping of sums or of pairs of sums that are mapping to a specific difference. But it's the same because you can just normalize everything by the number of all possible outputs and then you would get the difference distribution table or the probabilities. So the differential probabilities. And what Gore showed is basically to train a convolutional neural network as a differential distinguisher. So as something that can replace the difference distribution table. Because the difference distribution table would be quite hard 
especially for large cipher, to compute in an exhaustive way. Basically, you wanted to see if it is possible to train this CNN in order to get a differential distinguishers and see if we are able to uh, tell apart the encryption of something of a real message from the encryption of a uh, random message. And as a matter of fact, he showed that he's able, he was able to achieve a better accuracy than pure distinguishers, so those that are just trying to compute directly the uh, difference distribution table. On this specific cipher that is called spec, that has, like I said, a smaller state size of, I think in this case, even 32 bits. So it's very small. And the reason that is that small is that it is uh, designed for resource constrained environment. So for like hardware environment with constrained computational resources like Internet of Things or these kind of things. And uh, uh, so we have a small uh, state that in general could be brute forced. But in that case, the information does not need to be protected for a long time. So it is enough to say, OK, I'm happy to have it protected for the matter of, I don't know, a few seconds or something like that. I don't want the uh, attacker to be able to brute force it in the matter of a few seconds. And uh, actually, this pipeline here, so this convolutional neural network, was able to, let's say, cryptanalyze in the sense of the distinguishing attack uh, this specific cipher with 32-bit state size and 64-bit uh, encryption keys. And this is the specific uh, structure, let's say, of these uh, layers of this convolutional neural network. Except for going into the details, it is not important, but the problem, as usual, as you might know, is that artificial intelligence models, especially based on neural networks, are very hard to interpret because you have a black box model that is when you're doing the training, like with back propagation, doing some kind of optimization algorithms on the weights and propagating the error back, the neural network is converging towards a concept at a certain point, like to a specific decision, decision uh, surface. But it is not simple, it is not easy to understand why it converges to that particular decision uh, surface. And that also is the reason why we have, for instance, adversarial examples that show that the knowledge learned by neural networks is quite uh, fragile. And uh, this is related to the fact that we are not really sure what neural networks are learning in general. So they are hardly interpretable. So the idea would be to, let's say, work on the interpretability of these models. There are already a couple of works out there in the literature that are saying, okay, we are doing some kind of considerations using classical interpretability uh, techniques, let's say from the AI uh, realm, to understand what these specific neural distinguishers are doing over the cipher spec. One of the ideas that I had, that I think is interest interesting to explore, is to uh, let's say, replace some of the layers of these convolutional neural networks with what is called the convolutional genetic programming. So the idea of convolutional genetic programming, I don't know if you can, well, it's kind of a small uh, uh, resolution, but the idea is that, so maybe I can draw a quick diagram. So the idea is that you have like your image or your signal in general in a convolutional neural network and then you are going to apply like a small kernel like a local rule of a cellular automaton over this neighborhood and then you are shifting it like in this way and continuing to apply this, uh, this kernel. So this kernel here specifically is a linear combination of the uh, cells that are inside this specific point of the of the feature map. The idea of using genetic programming instead is different. Instead of having, let's say, a linear function that could be the scalar product of some weights, local weights that are defined by the kernel and the local input, we could have something more general that could be Um, that could be 
the output. So let's write it here again. The output of a, of a genetic programming tree. So this is still a local function in a certain sense. And the idea is that now we are going to shift it in a shift invariant way to get like the convolution in a certain sense. And uh, we already applied this in a paper in Gecko, like done with uh, Luca Manzoni and uh, Stefan also and uh, uh, two other authors to see if this was giving, let's say, at least as a proof of uh, concept, good results in doing what is called the pixel or imaging painting. So when you have like a damaged image with some pixels that are missing, and then you want to see whether genetic programming by using this convolutional uh, structure is able to reconstruct, to predict the values of the missing pixels by using the pixels surrounding the, the missing one. So the idea here would be similar in the sense of saying, instead of using a convolutional layer like in a neural network, we are using, we are evolving or we are learning the convolutional layer by using an evolutionary model such as genetic programming. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that genetic programming in general gives models that are more interpretable than neural networks because you have a tree and then trees usually are simpler to interpret. That's a big usually because sometimes it can be that they are quite difficult to, uh, to do. And as we said, like in a previous lecture, GP is affected by the phenomenon of uh, bloating. Mm. So uh, you could have something that is very, very big. And then you need Should first to prune something. Constrain to a max depth of a Yeah. Size. For instance, you could constrain to depth, or you could do some pruning afterwards, mm -hmm. or there are other kind of uh, tricks. But in general, let's say that it is easier to interpret, let's say, a formula that has been yeah. evolved by genetic programming rather than a linear combination of something plus some nonlinear activation functions that have been found by uh, an optimization. Uh, algorithm by just optimizing a loss function. That's the, the idea. Even if maybe they are not uh, immediately inter interpretable, mm -hmm. at least uh, with respect to neural network, they are easier to analyze in the yeah. lab, probably. Yeah. Even with uh, some post hoc explanation, maybe there is. Uh, yeah, maybe it is simpler also. I have a chance to, let's say, have uh, um, mm. more detailed analysis uh, of uh, what it was the reason. Yeah, the model. precisely. So, yeah, that could be something interesting to look into in, uh, in the future in, uh, in general. And uh, for the third direction, this is something that I thought like a couple of years ago, if the clicker wants to collaborate, okay. Um, so this slide we already saw in, uh, in the third lecture, if I remember correctly. So we have the problem of adversarial examples in, uh, in deep neural network. And uh, basically the idea here would be to, okay, it doesn't want to collaborate. So yeah, we know that they can be quite small and stealthy, these adversarial examples. And usually this is, well, usually there, are, there is one of the possibilities of using evolutionary algorithms mm -hmm. such as the one pixel attack to construct these adversarial examples. So one of the things that I wanted to uh, explore is that in evolutionary algorithm, there is this concept of fitness landscape analysis that we kind of mentioned at the end of the second lecture for Boolean function, I think. And the idea would be to employ fitness landscape analysis to analyze the space of adversarial examples. So to see how these evolutionary algorithms, why are so successful by analyzing the fitness landscape of their uh, optimization problem where they are trying to select uh, a pixel to provoke, to, uh, to, yeah, to provoke, let's say, a misclassification in the neural network. And one of the approach would be to use the so-called local optima networks. Local optima networks is an approach to fitness landscape analysis for combinatorial optimization problems where you have a graph, let's say, and in this graph, so each of these nodes is, uh, let's say, representing a local optimum in your optimization problem. And then you're going to connect two local optima if you're able to see that your uh, heuristic algorithm, such as an evolutionary algorithm, is able to jump from one or the other. What does it mean? It means that there is basically uh, 
this local optima, if you look at them from a dynamical system perspective, you can see them as attractors, basically. So you see that the uh, algorithm is attracted by this uh, specific local optima, which then becomes, let's say, uh, fixed points if you're not perturbing, perturb perturbing them enough. And uh, basically what you do is to compute the basins of attractions of this local optima. And then you say, okay, if these two local optima, for example, have some intersecting basins of attractions, then it means that I can go in both of them. So the algorithm can be uh, attracted to both local optima. So I'm going to connect them with, a, with an edge in this uh, graph. So you have substantially a simplified version, a simplified uh, representation of the fitness landscape instead of having the whole landscape with all other points that are not local optima. The idea is that with local optima, then after you have constructed this network, then you can study the topology of this network, of this graph, by using tools from uh, complex systems network or complex networks. So you want to see, for example, the distributions of the degrees of the nodes in this network, and then see if you are getting, for instance, a power load distribution, which would mean that you have a scale-free um, scale network that is a specific type of uh, network. Or otherwise, you could have small world networks, or you could have random networks. Uh, the bottom point, the bottom line is that once you get some information about the structure of this graph, of this network, then you can find some, some insights about how to improve your optimization algorithm and make it escape from the local optima and hopefully reach, if not the global optima, let's say at least some better local optima. So the idea is that right now it is not quite clear or at least it is clear a bit why the one pixel attack is uh, able to find these adversarial examples. It could be interesting to use also these tools from evolutionary algorithms to see why they are so successful, the one pixel attack with differential evolution. With just one caveat that of course here I'm talking about combinatorial optimization problems. This is the original definition of local optima networks. And uh, in general, in adversarial examples, we need, con we, need we are searching a continuous uh, space. But there has been also a recent generalization of local optima networks to continuous search space. So we can actually try to uh, apply these uh, tools to study also the search space of uh, adversarial examples. And then see if we are able to gain insight beside improving the one pixel attack also to see if we are able to find more robust uh, deep neural networks where we are not satisfying hypotheses that strong like those given to us by differential privacy. So maybe we are in a setting where we don't need that much uh, security that is guaranteed by differential privacy. So one could find some hybrid situation where some uh, robustness, empirical robustness uh, defenses based on this consideration could be valuable. Okay, so to wrap up, a few other ideas that I didn't develop in, uh, in these slides because we saw also other kind of uh, problems beside adversarial examples and uh, symmetric uh, encryption algorithms, uh, Boolean functions, etc. So for the part of side channel analysis, something that I looked into recently is to use a new revolution, where it means that you are using an evolutionary algorithm, typically a genetic algorithm, but you can also use genetic programming for that, mm -hmm. to evolve a neural network. What does it mean to evolve a neural network? It means of instead of using the classic optimization algorithms to optimize the loss function, you employ an evolutionary algorithm. Usually, if you just restrict yourself to the case of the optimization of the weights, and you keep everything else fixed in your network, then you, they already saw that evolutionary algorithms are quite bad for doing this. So it's definitely better to use classic optimizers based on the gradient, like Adam optimizers or uh, those kind of, uh, of methods. Um, but if you're also considering to 
you, you have a lot, you don't have only the weights as hyperparameters in your network. Mm -hmm. You also have the number of layers, you have the number of neurons, yeah. you have the activation functions, you have the type of architecture, like it yeah. could be convolutional or uh, uh, multi-layer perceptron field forward. Uh, so there are a lot of other hyperparameters and you can use these evolutionary algorithms to decide or to optimize the optimal architecture. And the idea would be to see what is the optimal architecture for deep neural networks that are applied to side channel analysis. Of course, this could also be applied in the same way to uh, mathematical cryptanalysis of ciphers. So to find the best architecture for um, for building up a neural distinguishers that we saw a few slides before. Then in the realm of private machine learning, there are also there are a few interesting uh, directions to look into. So one would be to see, okay, um, we didn't see it like today because there was not a lot of time and the field is quite huge. But basically when you're doing, when you're applying the, for example, the Gerbold circuit construction to make a specific neural network private, so you are evaluating it as a private circuit. Uh, the good point is that we are able to do quite efficiently linear functions. And that is okay because most of the things that we are doing in, uh, in, in machine learning in neural networks are linear functions. They are uh, multiplication of matrices by vectors, basically. The, problems come, the problem comes with um, activation functions that are nonlinear. So those are difficult to uh, do like in a uh, secure multi-party setting. And uh, in particular, what they do usually is to find some approximations of these uh, linear, of these activation functions that are, for example, piecewise linear or piecewise polynomial. Mm -hmm. Of course, these introduce some error, which basically means that you are reducing the accuracy of your model in order to save some privacy, of course. But one idea would be, for instance, to use optimization algorithms coming from heuristics such as genetic programming, I think it's quite interesting to look at for this, uh, for this problem, to design what I call MPC-friendly activation functions, so good approximations with a small error. And these activation functions have been found using genetic programming. Why it is so interesting? Because genetic programming has been used a lot for doing symbolic regression. So once you have like a set of points in a certain space, then you want to find what is the best interpolation of these points by finding a symbolic expression of it. Genetic programming has been used a lot to do this. And also in particular, semantic genetic programming is something that can be used to do it even, uh, even better. And finally, also see in private machine learning what I call adversarial examples under quotation marks because they are not exactly adversarial examples like we saw in these lectures in the sense that when you have some machine learning models that have that are hardened let's say so you're using multi-party computations like Gerbold circuit or something then sometimes like I said for instance for the problem of the activation functions that are not approximated well you could find an analogous of adversarial examples. So something that it is in the plain text version of the model is classified correctly. In the MPCR, the model is classified incorrectly. So here it would be interesting to see how to generate these adversarial examples using, for instance, again, some black box search method like uh, differential evolution or uh, what we saw yeah, in, the, in the last lectures. So in summary, I hope that in this course, uh, you saw that like this field like of, at the intersection of artificial intelligence and crypto is plenty of open problems in both directions, both for uh, AI for cryptography and using instead cryptography for AI models. And yeah, that's it. So this is the last slide. So thank you for your patience and uh, yeah. We will discuss them later for uh, some of the ideas for your assessment and also if you have other ideas other than those that I used for, uh, for these slides, just let me know and we can uh, discuss them. Good? Thank you. Thanks.